Hey there, loyal listeners. Mike Yarbrough here. Hey, before we jump into this episode with my friend Bob Brutus Hillebrand, I wanted to just do something a little bit out of the ordinary, and that is issue an apology to you guys. For you faithful listeners, over the last uh, several weeks and months, you may have noticed that the podcast episodes releasing has been somewhat sporadic, and uh, and and I've missed many weeks, and I'm disappointed about that. I know you guys are disappointed about that. Some of you guys have emailed me and said, hey, Mike, when's a new episode coming out? Well, I have some good reasons, but not very good excuses. And to be honest, the podcast has always been a challenge for me to manage on my own and to get it out there for you guys and to really be consistent with it like I'd like to. But lately, it's been even more of a challenge just because I've had some incredible success with Rustic in Maine. So this other business that's that I started has taken off. It's just doing really, really well. In fact, we just finished up our first month here in the new building. We've got about 3,000 square feet to play in, and uh, it's filling up rather quickly, actually. But this has given us the opportunity to bring on a few new people, including an operations manager. So we've got somebody that's going to be overseeing some of the day-to-day operations of the business, and that's going to help me out tremendously. But I want you guys to know this podcast and the mission of Wolf and Iron is really front and center for me in terms of where I'm going, where I'm headed. All the things that we're doing, even with Rustic in Maine, in my mind, is really leading me to be able to do this with you guys more and more. And we've got a lot of cool stuff coming down the pike. And even to kind of help me with some of the the challenges of releasing a podcast of high caliber with great interviews and all that kind of stuff, I'm actually going to be starting something called Truck Talk Thursday. So be on the lookout for these. This is going to be kind of like it sounds. It's basically me talking from my truck to you guys. So it's just off the cuff conversations. And those are going to be dropping every Thursday. I've got about 20 of those recorded already. So um, I've got about 15 minute drive to and from work. And so that gives me the opportunity to just chat with you guys about whatever's on my mind. And I think it'll be a great addition. It'll be a short form podcast format. So it'll be something you can quickly listen to, but it will also help me in making sure that I have some content that isn't too time consuming to get out there to you guys. More to come on the changes with Wolf and Iron down the road. But for now, that's it. On with the show. Duty, honor, country dictate what you ought to be what you can be, what you will be. The destiny of man is not measured by material computations. When great forces are on the move in the world, we learn we're spirits, not animals. Now, we are the masters of our fate. Howdy, gents. Welcome back to another episode of the Wolf and Iron podcast. I'm your host, Mike Yarbrough, founder and curator of wolfandiron.com. And I'm glad you're here. Man, I've got a great episode for you today. I'm talking with my friend Brutus. That's how I know him anyhow. Bob Hillebrand is his given name, his birth name. But I'll talk a little bit more in the episode about how he came about the name of Brutus for him and uh, how I know him as such. And Bob is one of those guys that you wouldn't expect to have the story that he does. You wouldn't know Bob and as he is now and say, Wow, this guy used to be a very successful entrepreneur. He had a great journey doing that. He's now dedicated a good bit of his life and his heart to bringing a bit of light to the orphans in the dark continent, as it's so-called Africa. And I think one of the things that really inspires me about Bob's story is just that, in many ways, he's the everyday guy that's really found his purpose. He knows what he's about. And it's yet another example of the many, many examples that I've had the opportunity to see in my life where someone becomes a Christian and the personality, their outlook on life, their purpose is radically changed for the better. Man, I can't think of a better adventure to be on than to do the kind of things that Bob is doing. Helping orphans in Africa, starting and managing the orphanages there. And look, guys, if you want to be a part of this uh, mission with Bob, head over to wolfandiron.com forward slash Brutus, B-R-U-T-U-S. You can see all the show notes, but also, and more importantly, see how to get in touch with Bob and his mission. Without further ado, here's my pal Brutus. All right, Bob Hillebrand, welcome to the Wolf and Iron Podcast. I'm glad to have you here. Yeah, thanks for having me, Mike. I know you had to have uh, quite the trek to to get here, uh, all the walking of, uh, what, you know, five or ten minutes yep. to, to my house. So this interview, guys, is a little bit different. Uh, Bob's here, uh, you know, in my, let's see, this is my oldest son's bedroom. So very cool, very cool podcasting suite here, as I've been kicked out of all the other rooms because of businesses and things like that. But uh, I know Bob, actually, I know him more as Brutus because you're an F3 guy. Right. And um, I'm trying to think about how to describe you to the audience. <laughs> um, let's see, you're a tall guy. You don't have any 
well, much hair. You got some gray on your face, and um, you run, man. Like you, you really. I love uh, running. You love to run, mm-hmm. and so and and if you were to see Bob, you'd go, "This guy is, is built to run. Like he's, you're made for it." So, uh, but you've also got a really big heart um, for a number of things. But particularly, I wanted to talk to you about your work with the Mission Servants Ministry that you started, and um, some of the the challenges of running orphanages overseas in Africa, and uh, and some of the things that you do here. And the, and the goal here really is for the guys that are listening to this to get some some inspiration for doing something that matters beyond just their regular day-to-day life, you know, where they're typically we go to work, we work for somebody else. Uh, we're kind of serving our families through doing that, you know, but it doesn't feel like we're making a very direct impact, you know, like we go to work, there's some goals there. We get paid money, that money ends up affecting our family. So there's it's very indirect a lot of times. Um, and of course, if you own your own business, it can feel more, um, you know, like you're having more of a direct impact on other people and on your life and you're doing something significant, but I really want guys to get from this. And so guys, if you're listening, um, I really want you guys to get from this, just, uh, just really the heart of, of a mission minded guy and to really be inspired by some of the things that Bob's got going on. So, uh, Bob, uh, I've introduced you physically in some weird way, but <laughs> give us a little bit of information about yourself and uh, and then even give us started get us started on how you got started with the ministry that you're part of. Okay, thanks. Uh, well, I'm uh, 57 years old. Um, I grew up uh, in Michigan. I've moved south here about 30 years ago. Um, just kind of as, as a young guy, um, kind of start my story at a place where I I was very. I was a very driven guy, uh, very goal oriented, um, and, and I had I remember long ago having three dreams for my life, and the three dreams were I wanted to be uh, an inventor, I wanted to have my own laboratory and invent things, I wanted to uh, be a missionary, and I wanted to be a dad, and uh, the first and last one made sense. The The middle one really didn't. I grew up, I was Catholic. Um, I didn't, re, I didn't, uh, well, I came to the Lord as a 37 year old. So I mm. came to know Jesus really late in life. And uh, I focused on the first two goals. Um, and I can say in hindsight now at, at 57, looking back, God was really good to me. And I was able to accomplish all three of my goals. And I didn't really see them all coming that way. Um, becoming, starting a ministry uh, 10, 11 years ago was kind of the last step. But uh, God's really blessed me in being able to do what uh, I feel He's called me and equipped me to do. So tell us about this ministry that you've started. Um, I hear about it a little bit as you're getting ready to go on a mission trip. You know, things will kind of stir up a little bit and you're asking guys for either if they want to go and support or if they want to financially support in some kind of way. And so I've been able to follow along a little bit, but give us an idea of like what the, um, what the mission servants ministry is. Okay. Um, back in 2000, well, 2000, uh, near 2000 after I was saved, um, I was just asking God, what, well, thank you for saving me first of all. And, um, but, what do you want from me? And and I, I really uh, took up a lot of my consciousness and thought and time and just what what's my purpose here and what do you want from me or what can I do? And uh, I, I was dedicated to spending the rest of my life thanking God for what he did for me. And uh, I was kind of led to uh, using my skills and experiences as an engineer and an entrepreneur to, to helping people do things that they can't do for themselves. And I got involved in disaster recovery and involved with uh, using my handyman skills and things like that to helping people. And uh, I guess my specific ministry started in 2006. Um, I, just a friend and I, we were just talking about uh, Africa and about this drought that was in Africa. And it, and how this uh, culture was disappearing, these people that are um, herders of cows. Yeah. And it was just disappearing because there was no water, there was nothing for the cows to eat, the cows were dying, the people rely on drinking cow blood and cow meat to survive, and this Jeez. whole culture was disappearing. So I hooked up with a couple of guys, and um, a couple of them had um, a ministry on their heart to go teach 
churches there about 12-step programs. And me and a friend of mine, we'd say, hey, let's just go help these people. I mean, how hard can it be to rent a truck and fill it full of food and go go feed some people? Sure. And so we did it. And uh, it's a lot harder than it sounds, I'll tell you that. But, <laughs> but we actually went over there, um, spent a couple of weeks. We rented a truck. We raised money. We filled it full of food. We drove out in the desert. And it had not rained for like three and a half years in this place. And we drove this truck out into the, into the desert. And we parked in this big flat spot. And um, 1,200 people came out of the woodwork, just came crawling towards us and um my friend and i we we were a little a uh, little scared at that point we go well, okay this is why people don't do that we just <laughs> thought we were going to get mobbed and robbed yeah. and you know the truck torn apart and everything and we actually crawled up on top of the truck and we watched this unfold and these people came and they orderly lined up and we started telling them about god and uh, why we were there and the clouds started forming around us, and it actually started raining all the way around us oh, man, in yeah. the uh, on the horizon. And people were seeing this, and and we were distributing the food and and praising God. And then as soon as we were finished, it started raining there, and it rained for three days. And it was it was just an awesome time where uh, God was really confirming that He called me over there, and I went. And um, after that, we. Uh, visited an orphanage. We were, the people we were working with had just started this orphanage, and they said, hey, you want to visit this orphanage? So I'd never been to one, and so we went there, and man, God just like grabbed my heart, and I could not forget that place, for, could not forget those kids, and that was in 2006. Um, I came home, um, took six months to convince my wife to go back with me, and we went back, and at that time, we... Um, we felt that God just asked us to take over sponsorship of that orphanage. It was only a year old at the time, and we didn't know anything about orphanages or where we were going to even find the money. Our business wasn't doing really well at that time, and we just uh, totally stepped out in faith. Um, we took on that orphanage. It, it required $1,200 a month to take care of 23 kids at that time. Yeah. And... Uh, had no idea where that was going to come from. And God was just faithful every month uh, to helping us and giving us what we needed. And we, uh, from that point on, just year after year, uh, we bought land, we built buildings, we put in solar power, we drilled wells, we did whatever was needed. And uh, God brought to us what, what we needed. Um, we named the ministry Mission Servants Ministry because we uh, we just felt on our hearts that it's not really our place to go do things, like go over there and just say, hey, we're here and we're doing this for you. Yeah. We felt that God was already calling people to do things and that there was people out there that needed help to get it done. Like, uh, for instance, at this orphanage, these people had an abandoned building and they felt called to help these children. So they had 23 children in there, but... They didn't have any means of water. They didn't have any means of cooking. They didn't have any electricity. And they had no idea how to go about getting any of that stuff. So that's where we came in. And we, we were able to help them through that kind of stuff and uh, felt, yeah, that's that's what we are. We're really serving other ministries. So that's how we named ourselves Mission Servants. Yeah. Man, that's cool. That's a great story too. And uh, I'm just thinking about you guys being known as like the miracle rainmakers now, like in Africa, <laughs> you know. Uh, and just come back and, and make other things appear. Um, that's man, that's great. That's great that God blessed you guys in that way. So I'm trying to think about. I'm trying to imagine what it's like over there. Like, give me some visuals as to you know we've got these sort of pictures in our head of like you know the TV commercials and stuff from back in the day. Um, you know, what's it like for like the average kid over there? Like, how are they viewed? Uh, what kind of access do they have to like education and and, and those sort of things? In the air, well, you know, it varies widely in Africa where you are. Um, we are in two places primarily um, in central Uganda and central Kenya and western Kenya. Uh, and they're rural. Um, we're outside of the cities. So it's, it's a farming kind of area. Um, people survive by growing stuff. Uh, there are trading centers where people, you know, they, uh, they sell things, uh, used clothing or, you know, whatever. 
Uh, they dry out beans and corn. They um, make charcoal. They little welding shops, that kind of stuff. Um, in both countries, the governments provide schools, but they're terrible. They're, yeah. they're just really awful. And uh, a classroom could have a hundred kids. There'd be no desks, no books. Um, you know, they have to share paper. You know, it's just uh, there's really no learning going on. Um, a lot of the better schools are where, where people just decide we got to make a better school and they'll call them private schools, but, um, they charge fees for the kids to come. So most kids don't go to, basically most kids don't go to school. If you, if you walk through the countryside, um, uh, during school time, most there's kids everywhere. Kids don't have shoes. They don't have, uh, you know, good clothes or anything like that. Um, Families there are, are huge. Uh, you know, it could be you know, as many as a dozen kids in a family. Uh, polygamy is very common. You know, the, uh, a man would have several wives. Um, people don't work, what we would call work. So just poverty is just, just a, a way of life and people, it's just a way of life. Um, the thing that strikes me about kids though, yes, about kids specifically, it's really a stark difference between Africa and here is kids are not valued there. Like they, like they're valued here, you know, right. kids may even be overvalued here. You know, sometimes mm -hmm. kids could be a small G God to somebody here, you know, where you just pretty worship your kids and that's your main focus. Uh, there, they're just, you know, you just got kids and they're, um, they're not valued like, like they are here in the, the bond between a father and a, a child, you don't see there. You never see a, a father playing with his kid. You never see a father. Rarely do you see men in church. Rarely do you see men interacting with kids. It's just, it's just different. And yeah. it's very sad. Yeah. And that's, you know, unfortunately that's the way I've, I've heard from other people as well, uh, is that kids just aren't seen as, um, as really a gift from God. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's something that you know, I think we get, we kind of sort of almost subconsciously think about that, but it's really, it's, it's cultural for us because of the, just growing up with this mindset, right? Of that, you know, your children are a blessing from the Lord. Um, and I could see it, you know, very easily that, you know, kids over there, when you don't have much kids are, uh, you know, uh, uh, it's a challenge, right? Mm -hmm. To raise kids and just another mouth to feed and that kind of stuff. Tell me about some of the cult, the cultural issues that you face over there. Like, you know, not just language and stuff like that, but just just trying to get across an idea or a, a thought to them that they, that is really like anti to the way they perceive reality or the way they think about stuff. And that may be the fact that kids need to be valued. They need to have, need to be raised and educated and that kind of stuff. But are there any other, other examples that you can think of where it just, you're kind of culturally butting heads with people over there? Well, um, uh, kind of along the lines of, of how kids are thought of, um, it's, it's really quite a, quite a dark thing towards children and women there in general. I think culturally, um, you know, men are the, the top of the, the, the social chain or the, right. the culture there. Women are, um, you know, women are definitely below. Women do most of the work. Um, children are still are way below. And it's quite common for, um, you know, abuse of women, abandonment of women, um, extremely common for abuse of children. Uh, it's just, uh, it's epidemic. It almost, it's very common to kids that we, we know and talk to or, or bring in. They've been abused by uh, family members, fathers, neighbors. Um, they're just treated you know, sexually and uh, labor-wise as slaves. It's just, just very common. It's just kind of boils down to there's no value to them. I think, um, I, I think in Uganda especially, I guess the idea of going through an effort to build a home, to, to shelter, care for, love, educate, and value children, that's a little bit cross-cultural yeah. because given their choice, the people would rather we gave them money so they mm -hmm. could build a better house or build, you know, a better farm or own a cow or, you know, whatever it might be. And then why, you know, why are you helping the children? And in our, um, our message, and we have a church also at the, at the, uh, orphanage that is for the community that the, 
the leaders of the orphanage are um, the church leaders. And, uh, you know, the message is that God loves us all and that children are a blessing and, and we're to value them and they're our future. And, you know, and just any solution that's going to happen in Africa is going to be from within. It's going to be from the kids growing up yep. wanting to change things. And so we go through great effort to, to value the children. Um, and uh, that, that I think, butts, butts into some of their cultural values. Yeah. So I'm just thinking about this, this uh, kind of from this perspective. You know, a lot of times we view God here in the West, really anywhere, I guess. We have some sort of either limit, limiting views of God based on our the, the way our fathers raised us, right? Or maybe if we had a really good, good father, it's easier for us to, to assume that God is a good, loving father as well. And I'm just thinking about how much of a light you are, not just you, but, you know, the whole team, right, that goes there and has this message of, you know, uh, not only do we value you, right, like as a, you know, organization, but you you actually belong to uh, a loving heavenly father, right? The creator of all things, the biggest dad that you can have. Mm -hmm. And he loves you guys, you know, you know, uh, more than you can even imagine. And I'm just thinking about how much of a, I think for a lot of kids, it would just be really difficult to believe in some ways. But I think also just like, because there is something in our conscience that tells us, that's really the the hope that we have, right? Is that there is someone out there who really, really mm -hmm. loves us and values us. And when you say, uh, as the creator of, of all things, right, that loves you, and he's actually sent us here to to help you guys out, um, I just think, gosh, man, like what? I can't think of a bigger impact, right, to mm -hmm. make to to some kids and uh, and just their whole view on life, their whole view on the reality and why they're here and what this world's about and and that kind of stuff. Um, so I think that's just that's just great. Yeah. The um... Just to go off of that, the, I really believe as a missionary that, um, you know, you can say all the words that you want to say, you know, but people's ears are not going to be open if you're not addressing, you know, their the needs that are in their life at the moment. And they really see that you care. They're not going to care about what you say if they don't see that you care about what they need. And so, yeah, when, um, when you let your actions speak um, – as a demonstration of what you know the love of God is in your life, mm -hmm. it, it just it just means a tremendous amount. Um, yeah, and you know I've come to know too. Like I, I was blessed with a really great dad. My my dad was awesome, and uh, even though I, I was very stubborn and I didn't come to Christ <laughs> until I was thirty seven, my dad made it really easy for me to believe that there's a loving God, and. Uh, it was not my dad's fault at all that I was uh, that I was so stubborn. Um, but these guys in uh, in Africa did did I've come to realize they just don't have that benefit of that loving dad that really reflects the love of God in in their lives. And so I've I've just felt that's been my calling, you know, to to be that dad or to be that example for them. And um, it's that kind of combines my my last two goals of being a dad and being a missionary and it's really a blessing to me yeah so before we started this you, you talked about uh being a really driven guy in your early age and uh doing things like you know being successful career-wise running a boston marathon accomplishing basically as you said every goal that you'd set for yourself in life now the, the the Bob that I know, the Brutus that I know, I'm not saying that you're not. You seem more, much more laid back and much more mm -hmm. of a chill kind of guy. And I'm wondering, did that happen when you were saved, or did that happen just over time, or has, has this uh, dealing with this mission uh, and this ministry has that really kind of softened you up and kind of made you more of an easygoing guy? Oh uh, yeah, it's definitely happened. You know, when I was saved, or you know, shortly after that, and uh, all my close friends. Uh, would say the same thing. You know, I'm really blessed. I still have all my friends from my college years. We, cool. we get together up in Michigan and, and share time together and they've all been born again and everything. And uh, so we've, I'm really blessed to have old friends and they, they'll, they'll say exactly the same thing. I, uh, uh, I don't know, you know, God, God lets us do run our own race and do our own thing and make our own mistakes and, you know, in the end, he uses that. And, uh, you know, had I not been broken, I maybe would have never found him. Had I not, um, you know, been as driven as I am, maybe I wouldn't have gathered the skills together that I need right now. I mean, you just never know. God will use wherever you've been and whatever you do, if you're willing to give it back, and you know, in a humble way. But um, 
Yeah, I definitely grew up and all the way up until uh, I was saved. I, I just felt that I didn't want to die looking back thinking, oh, I wish I would have done that. I wish I would have jumped out of an airplane. I wish I would have, you know, hiked the Appalachian Trail. I wish I would have done this. I wish I would have done that. And I, and I felt the, the biggest regret in my life would be that I had a regret that I didn't do something I wanted to do. Then, then when I, uh, I realized that I needed a savior and gave my life to Christ, I mean, that's not my focus anymore. My focus would be now, uh, I, I, it would break my heart if I thought that I didn't do something God wanted me to do. Oh yeah. Yeah. You know? So it's, it's a totally different focus. Yeah. So no, it's really good. The, the, the thought of that, it's what God wants you to do, not necessarily what you want mm -hmm. to accomplish. You know, when we think about our lives as being just this materialistic, naturalistic thing where there's no afterlife or we're just not sure what it is, we do put way too much focus on this life. You know, we're trying to squeeze as much out of this as we can. Mm -hmm. And I think people realize that this is a gift. So even if you're an atheist, you recognize that this life is a gift. It's, uh, you know, it's miraculous in some kind of ways without it being supernatural. That's how, where you're coming from. But if you're uh, so it doesn't really matter where you come from in this view. You realize that you've got a very unique opportunity to be a human being that's alive and all of that, right? But like you said, where it does change your perspective is when you when you become saved and you think, oh, I've got eternity, right? And there are things that actually matter more than me and my happiness, right? That's just such a drastic uh, shift in a person's mind. And I think we see that more... It's, it's more evident when someone gets saved later in life because they're going a certain way and they've built a certain pattern and then it just stops you in your tracks and you're like, man, I, I'm going about this the wrong way, right? Mm -hmm. But it does also, it removes a lot of stress. It removes a lot of um, a lot of ego and things of that nature and just says, you know, let's refocus, right? It just reframes everything that you do, everything that you think about. That's right. Um, tell us about some of the challenges that you faced uh, just over the years and setting up these orphanages or running these orphanages? Because uh, we've talked a little bit about the cultural kind of headbutting, but what are the other challenges that you that you run into, like even maybe just finding good people or whatever? Yeah, um, I, uh, I kind of summed it up recently to a group I was talking to that, because we've, we've been through a few uh, few troubles with people in the last few years over, the, over in Africa. And, you know, just summing up missionary work or mission work is hard. I mean, the devil is uh, wanting to stop it. And uh, the devil's resourceful, powerful, um, and just always, he doesn't sleep. It just always is ongoing. And uh, because, of our, because of our mission uh, priority of working through other people, we have to we don't take control uh, of certain things and we have to just rely on the Holy Spirit doing his work in the people that we're working with. And sometimes, you know, cause people have a free will, they, uh, they turn away. And um, so let's just take our, our, uh, our orphanages, for instance, okay. we don't have missionaries managing the orphanages. We work with people that have, that God's given them, a calling on their heart to, to start a home for children. So these are people that are local. They're generally pastors. They generally say there's a lot of kids in our area that are, that are uh, vulnerable and need homes. And so they, they start an orphanage and then they cry out to God at some point and say, Oh, you know, we, we, we need help. We, we need buildings. We need this, we need that. And then God answers their call by, you know, by humble, humbly somehow getting, mission servants or Bob Hillebrand involved and we come across people with just generally that same kind of story. We started this a year ago and, and, uh, we cried out to God that we need help and hey, then you showed up. And so I, I believe God is active and working that way. And, but, um, in Kenya, for instance, the, this family that we were working with, this pastoral family that had started the orphanage there, I believe they, like everybody that starts a ministry, has great intentions at first, but there's temptations that, that come along. And uh, over the years, uh, especially, I think, in Africa, when it's just a matter of a few thousand dollars flowing through their hands, that would be like, to us, it would be like hundreds of millions of dollars flowing mm -hmm. through our hands. Yeah. It's just an inconceivable amount of money that they would never would see. And 
over time, you know, temptations have taken over where, uh, in, in Kenya, a couple of years ago, their priority became more protecting their lifestyle. They, they probably were skimming a little bit of money. They were relying on sharing the food that the kids had. They were relying on this and that. And then, um, there was a case where some older children were abusing some of the younger children. And instead of bringing that to light, uh, they hid it and they were afraid of how, uh, how mission servants would react. And it was hidden. Then it became kind of ingrained in that culture uh, of that home. And there wasn't a, there wasn't a, uh, uh, an atmosphere of, of honoring God every day. It was more of an atmosphere of, we don't want to lose what we have yeah. and it was not God honoring at all. And then when we found that out, it was a terrible heartbreaking thing to us and we had to correct it. And, uh, we replaced pretty much the entire staff and changed the way we did things there. And, um, so that, that was a, that was a terrible thing. We went through something similar in the last year in Uganda where the, it was limited to just the director, um, it was a godly man that started that orphanage in 2013. And, uh, boy, he, he, um, uh, got to a point where he kind of made himself his own little God and uh, every just had strict control over everything. The children, he was looked at like hit, they were his, he was using them for his own uh, material and physical needs. Um, he was stealing and, um, nobody would bring that to our attention because they were afraid. They were just all terrified that, Oh, if Bob finds out he's going to quit funding, you're, you're not going to be able to go to school. You're not going to get fed anymore, you know, blah, blah, blah. And uh, the, it was just a terrible situation. We discovered that and corrected that. Um, you know, it was really tempting just to go, oh, we can't, we can't help these people. They're like this, you know, yeah. and it was really tempting to quit. And in fact, uh, in fact, I think I did quit. And um, we, we, when I was there last summer and we discovered that in Uganda, you know, I'll admit I, uh, I, I did quit. I, I even called my travel agent and got my plane ticket to come home early and got that changed and God just wouldn't let that happen. Thankfully, um, there were some situations came up where it gave us some hope that no, it's, it's something we can, uh, God can fix and, uh, change. Some people came to us, some things changed, and we decided to stick it out. And we actually um, we actually got involved with the government and with the police. And uh, I jokingly say that we uh, we staged an armed coup on foreign <laughs> soil, and we went in there with armed, awesome. yeah. with, our, with the Ugandan army, and we took that orphanage back over and removed that man. He's been jailed and prosecuted oh, man, and all awesome. that. And we rescued those kids a, for a second time, yeah. and it... I'm just so thankful God didn't let me quit. Yeah. And God, God had another plan for those kids. And it's, um, I had, I had asked his forgiveness because in my heart, I, I did think it was beyond me and I didn't, um, I didn't, I, I didn't have the faith there. I should have, but God didn't let us quit. Yeah. No, man, that's awesome. And I remember that, uh, <clears throat> kind of going through the F3 channels. If you guys aren't familiar with F3, I keep mentioning that you can go to F3.org or F3.com. I think, just go to F3. You'll find it. Google it. And uh, it's just basically it's a... a F3 kind of, Nation, I think. Oh, is it F3 Nation? Yeah. Okay, yeah. See, there you go. F3 Nation. Oh, yeah, I don't know what F3 is. That might be something totally different. <laughs> <laughs> F3 Nation, right. And uh, but basically it's a... a uh, it stands for Fitness, Fellowship, and Faith. It started here in, um, in Charlotte. And it's just a thing that's just taken off for guys to get fit, get to know each other, fellowship, and all that kind of good stuff. So, um, so kind of dovetailing into what you just said. How do you personally handle disappointment or failure when you, you know, you're disconnected from what's going on over there to some degree, right? And maybe to to a great degree, you know, during the week. And so there are things that are going on that you can't really practically have your your hands on. And like you said, your the model is that you're really trusting in those people to sort of lead and and uh, and to carry on uh, the mission. But how do you personally handle like that kind of disappointment, that sort of failure, when you're like, man? I, you know, I should have done this better, you know, or I should have, I should have stepped in earlier. I should have done any tips there. Oh, that's a great question. I, uh, you know, I, I think of myself as a, as a father to the kids, you know, and we got 60 kids now in Uganda and 60 in, in Kenya. And, uh, oh, 
yeah, I had to had to really struggle with, uh, you know, asking God to forgive me for if I if it's my fault that I let that go on. Uh, I had to forgive myself. Um, it, yeah, it's it's very difficult. Um, I, it was under my watch. I don't know if I could have done anything different. I, I, I can't really see necessarily where I could have. Um, we're operating under what I think, you know, God, how God wanted us to, to operate and not, not have control, but, but work through people. But no, I definitely take responsibility for it. And it's very, it, it's one of my life's greatest, um, uh, struggles or greatest uh, things that I, I struggle with that I've allowed to happen. Yeah. But you got to forgive yourself and, uh, knowing that God forgives you. And it's all about going forward. I mean, I've learned a lot, I've learned a lot of things like that will never happen again. Um, we've doing things a little bit differently and you just got to go forward. Um, probably the main thing that, that I've done differently, um, is uh, we always had a mission statement for what we have over there um, working with these different groups. And the mission statement is always, we honor God with all we do first. Second is we, we serve and protect and love children. And third is uh, everything we do should be a testimony in, in physical form of uh, the love of Jesus Christ in our life. So, Obviously, those three things were violated in both the situations that I described. Um, but we, you know, it was more like, yeah, we wrote those down. We posted them on the wall. We talked about it. But I, I didn't I didn't feel like I, I made that in, in every decision and every everything, constantly reinforcing it with the people there. Yeah. And uh, so now... You know, we made a big uh, sign. It's the first thing you read when you walk in the door, you know, at our place now. It's a big sign outside by the guardhouse. Uh, we live it and everything. And whenever there's a question or a decision to be made, it's always like, oh, let's let's go back through our mission statement. Okay, how would we, if we, if we read these three things, how would we answer these questions and make this decision? And it's always pretty clear. And uh, so really enforcing that, uh, yeah, you know, mindset deeply is uh, what I feel like God wants us to do. And that's the lesson for our life too. You know, you got to keep the, you got to, you got to keep the principles in mind in, in everything you do and not make the decision at any given time, but to make it way up front that this is how I'm going to live my life with principles. Yeah. <clears throat> and then the decisions are easy as you, as you come across them, as the temptations come across, they're very easy to pass by. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, in, in, whenever we're leading something, we do want to take ownership of it. You know, when something fails on our watch, you know, even if it's something that we could really practically say that we just wouldn't have known better, we couldn't have had a, a better handle on it or, or what, whatever the case may be. But at the same time, I, I try to remind myself, you know, Jesus's disciples fled, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, these guys walked with Jesus. They, you know, saw him do miracles and a couple of Roman guards showed up and they bolt. And I just thought, you know, in one sense, does Jesus take ownership of that? Like he didn't teach them to be courageous enough, or is he just saying, well, that's part of the plan. There's a greater plan here. And that's what they're supposed to do, obviously with, uh, with Peter and his denial of Jesus. Um, so I think there's, the, I think that there's a, you know, anytime we're taking ownership, I think there has to be a level of understanding that God's also working and the devil's also working, you know, in people. And there's this whole aspect of free will where people are doing things that, you know, really, um, I don't necessarily think we're going to be judged for somebody else's actions. You know, mm. uh, I'm sometimes reminded of the, uh, Jesus's, um, command to people to say, uh, you know, you've heard it said that you should walk a mile. You know, if a soldier comes and asks you to carry his stuff, you should walk a mile. I say you should go two miles because you know, you love them. And, uh, you know, Jesus doesn't get into where the, what the soldier is going to be doing with his armor mm. and with his swords and stuff like that. Right. He doesn't get into where that soldier's going or what people the soldier's going to oppress. It's like, you know, he's got his own, the soldier's got his own sort of battle to fight in his own kind of way. But, um, you know, you've got, yours is just to be obedient, right? To be faithful right. and to love people. And so I think that there is, where there's ownership and leadership, absolutely. Uh, we've got to have that. And you've obviously made some corrections by taking ownership. But I think forgiveness can kind of come in that form as well as just understanding that, you know, God's at work in ways that, that we don't understand. And um, we, we're not, 
omniscient. We're not omnipotent. We don't have sovereignty over everything. And, uh, and so we, we do have to be able to forgive ourselves. Um, tell us about how to get in touch with what you're doing over there. Cause I want to point the guys over to mission servant ministry. Uh, we have a website, uh, mission servants, ministries.org. I'm sorry. Our website is mission org. Okay. And, uh, on there I, I blog. Um, so I, I kind of, you know, keep, especially when we're doing trips I blog multiple times about what's going on and what we're doing. There's, uh, plans and pictures and all that sort of thing. Uh, um, the way that we're funded as mission servants, I, well, I was, my wife and I, we were blessed to uh, sell our company that we had for 20 years and uh, figured that we had, had everything we needed. And uh, so we sold our company four years ago and uh, this is what I do now. Um, I'm not paid or anything like that. And we, we have all that we need. So I'm, I've started my second career. I, I call it that uh, just, um, just, just, organizing and, uh, and leading mission servants. I have a, we have a board and we have people that support us. Um, each child in both orphanages, we, we have a, a sponsor program for them. So the, each child has one sponsor, $50 a month covers the, the expenses of that child for everything, food, mm -hmm. clothing, you know, the expenses of the home, their education, all that sort of thing. And then we encourage people to have a relationship with the kids to be able to email them and write letters or whatever they may be. We, uh, we make trips over two, three times a year. Um, and we have projects that we plan throughout the year. Um, and so people, people, are, I believe are called by the Holy spirit to join us. Uh, uh, we go to Hickory Grove Baptist church and they're very supportive of us there. Um, uh, friends and family and F3 group and, I, I just love talking about what God's doing. It's not, not what we're doing at all. It's just cool how I see God working, just like that very first time when uh, God kind of led us to that one spot and all those people came came to us for food and water and then it rained and just yeah. it, God just validated his, you know, his, uh, his control and presence over that situation and just all the different things all the way through, even to last summer when we were ready to quit and God said, no, you're not quitting. You're, you go back and rescue those kids again and take this over. And so, um, I just love talking about it. God is just awesome. God is working through all kinds of people and you don't necessarily have to go up and go to Africa, but, um, I, th I think if God's calling you to do something, you, you ought to do it. You yeah. Know, not absolutely. only because it's God and you ought to do it, but, that's where you're going to find your most joy. I, I got to say, I'm, I find my most joy of my life is just in, in where I am now. And, uh, you know, using the skills and experience that God has for me and, and just helping these kids and just knowing I'm just a piece of whatever story God has in their life. It's just very, really cool. Man, it's awesome. There's a question I wanted to ask. I forgot to ask it earlier, but I'll ask it now. Um, do you guys have control or maybe, maybe control is not the right word, but do you guys have influence over the curriculum and stuff that the kids learn like when they're at the, the orphanage and that kind of stuff? Uh, well, all the kids go to school, of course, during the day. Okay. Um, and um, some cases they're private schools where they get a Christ Christian kind of background. Um, and in other cases, they're just the, the government schools. Um, but even the government schools are sponsored by churches. Mm -hmm. So there's a, it's kind of different there that, that actually is kind of nice. Um, you know, God's not been banned from schools. God's not been banned from anything. If you just look, you know, like on taxis and trucks, there's like, you know, Jesus is my Lord all written all over them. Yeah. It's just kind of cool. God's not been banned from that society yet. Uh, but at the orphanage, um, the director is a pastor. Um, every night there's a devotion. The kids lead it lots of times. The older kids, um, you know, have, have a little Bible reading and they do a lot of singing and dancing. Um, it's, it's really quite nice. Uh, so it's pretty much a nightly thing. Uh, the dining hall that we built for the kids is also the church for the community. And there's a couple hundred people that come to church on Sunday. Uh, it's a, it's, it's a beautiful building and, um, it's really a beautiful 
place to worship. I, I love it when I'm there. It's like a four hour church service of lots of singing and dancing and the word and testimonies and people participating. And it's really pretty awesome. But the kids are involved in all of that. Um, a lot of the kids have been baptized. Um, we brought, we had the pleasure on my last trip. I just got back a couple of weeks ago. We, uh, we had built the infrastructure of the orphanage up to where we were able to bring in 20 more kids. And so we had 40 for the first couple of years, and now we have 60, 59. We were able to bring in 19 new kids in January. And that was, that was just the, the coolest thing that I was able to be part of, that we were all able to be part of, to meet these kids for the first time that I can describe it when they walked in and they saw that they had a bed and they had clothing and they had blankets and they had a little playground and they had a latrine and they had food just all the basics that we take for granted. Yeah. It was like Disneyland for them. And they were just so excited. And these kids are between five and 13 years old. And it was just really cool. Um, two of the young girls came up to me and wanted to talk to me about Jesus and about how Jesus could become come into their life. And they ended up praying to receive Jesus in their life. And that was just really cool. That was a highlight for me. And uh, so these, these kids definitely... Um, are taught the practical side of Jesus loving it, them. Yeah. And also um, they have Bibles and, and hear the word uh, quite clearly. So um, th these are, these are souls that would be lost if, you know, if they weren't exposed, the areas in there, there, I mean, there's, there's Muslim, there's, there's Christian. Most people just are nothing. Um, there's a lot of witchcraft also in the area too. That's probably the most predominant. Yeah thing is just ancestor worship, um, witchcraft kind of thing. And yeah, uh, it's a, it's a dark area and it's no different than here. It's just in a different form. Mm -hmm. Um, but if you never, never are exposed to the love of God in your life, you just are never going to know. And, um, so we're just privileged that, uh, we're able to do that for these kids. Man, that's awesome. Well, thanks for what you do over there. Uh, I mean, you're, you're changing lives, right? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and you're helping uh, God have an avenue to kind of work through um, with other people there as well. So just appreciate what you do there. And actually, it's, it's an inspirational thing for us to hear about back here in the States, right? For the guys, especially that know you and get a chance to kind of get a little peek into some of these stories. And even some of the F3 guys that have gone over there with you. Uh, I think Skipper went. Didn't he go yep. with his family? Skipper yeah. and his, uh, his, his 14 wife. year old son. Oh, his 14 yeah. year old son, yeah. Yeah, he had a great time. Yeah. So, I mean, just the opportunity to serve and to, uh, to be on mission and to, 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 to have something that you're doing that's significant and you're setting an example for a lot of guys. So appreciate yeah, that. And the, the really cool thing is you don't, you know, in a lot of, a lot of organization stuff, you can donate your money and send your money, but I've, um, I don't know. I was always just kind of like, that's just a little unfulfilling for me just to give your money. It's yeah. easy to give your money. Mm -hmm. Uh, but to give your time, your experiences, your uh, your expertise and that sort of thing. And um, God just knew that was how I built. So, you know, to, to actually carry my money or my friend's money or whoever over to Africa and actually spend it and do things that are concrete, that, that really help. It's just amazing. Just the just for instance, the budget of mission servants is just a little over $100,000 a year. Hmm. And for that, we're totally providing for over a hundred kids and wow. different projects and building buildings and drilling wells. And, and, uh, I mean, that's not a lot of money Yeah, and it's because every dollar that's donated is gets spent right there. I mean, there's no, there's no administration, there's no salaries, there's no nothing. And, uh, it doesn't take a lot of money. Money is really powerful. If you, if you, if it's handled right and used as a proper tool and, um, and also it doesn't, it's not, things can have an end too. You know, we, we're seeing kids now for the first time that are finishing their high school and finishing their trade school, getting jobs. Yeah. There's, um, uh, one girl that, that finished in December, she's got a job in a hotel in Kampala in, in <laughs> hospitality. And she got a, got a certificate in hotel hospitality and she got a job. And another girl just, I was just told a couple of days ago that she, she got a certificate in hairdressing and she got hired in the hair, in the hairdressing salon. So she's got a job and she's starting her adult life and yeah. being able to know that she can support herself. It's, it's just incredible. Yeah.
Yeah, absolutely. It's incredible. Yeah. And so, I, you know, for you guys who are listening to this, I want you to be able to get in touch with Bob. Uh, head over to wolfandiron.com forward slash Brutus, B-R-U-T-U-S, and because uh, that's how I know him. And you guys will be able to find out, uh, the, see the show notes on this episode, but also see how to get in touch with him and the, uh, the ministry that he's a part of. Thanks, man, for being here. Thanks, Mike. Well, there you have it, men. I'd love to know what you thought about the episode. Feel free to reach out to me on any of my social media networks. And look, if you got something out of this, make sure another guy does too. Share the episode and make sure it gets in front of the guys that need to hear it the most. Until next time, keep your powder dry. And may a fair wind be always in your sails. <laughs>